you can start okay uh, so hi everybody i'm a little bit or more frustrated to not see uh, all all of you uh, I, I assume that you have the same feeling. So I would like just to provide one information. You are not alone. No? And now at this time, we, we are 25 participants. And I guess that uh, these are the first minutes of the session. So this will, uh, this will increase. Here I am in an amphitheater and I have some students with me. Uh, so this is the reason for, for which I'm wearing a, a mask. Uh, okay, so uh, in these sessions related to the patterns, we have uh, three papers. Um, uh, so all uh, presenters, as you know, have 20 minutes uh, of talk and 10 minutes of questions and answers. And I would like uh, to send a special request to the participants, please, because we are not seeing each other, it is really important uh, to have your feedback for the authors, because otherwise I assume that for them it is also more or less frustrating. So please uh, send your messages, questions, answers, or even via chat. I think we have you have the chat uh, session. So I would like to provide the, the, the floor to the first presenter now, Sarah Bougelia, uh, who will present a paper titled Reusable Abstractions of Patterns for Recognizing Compositional Conversational Flows. Uh, and I assume that this is Anna Kalankova who will provide uh, the floor to, <laughs> to, to Sarah. Thank you very much, Anna. <laughs> I'm feeling as a, in a you know, as a, a five or six dimensions, I mentioned something like that. <laughs> without seeing people. We are 30 now. So it's increasing. You are not alone. <laughs> so Sarah, you can start. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you for this introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be with you today. My name is Sarah Bougelia and I'm a PhD student at UCBL University in France. And today I'm going to present you our work on reusable dialogue patterns for recognizing compositional conversational flows. Nowadays, with the noteworthy growth of digital tools and services, uh, users need technologies such as task-oriented conversational bot that offer a quick access to these services. This conversational bot uh, they enable the understanding of user need called user intent, which is expressed in a natural language. Then the bot fulfills this user need by invoking the appropriate backend service. And finally, the bot returns a human-like response to the user. This user bot uh, interaction seems pretty simple. The user asks something and the bot responds. Uh, but it turns out that studies on human conversation patterns reveal that human bot conversations are more complex than it seems. And this is one example of complex interactions. Here the user wants to, uh, the user is looking for a restaurant, then he wants or she wants to book a taxi. In order to book a taxi, the bot needs to know what is the destination address. But the destination address is missing. Uh, here, the user said to the restaurant, meaning to the address of the restaurant. In linguistic theory, this is known as anaphora, meaning that uh, people are not always precise. Sometimes, uh, they just refer to previous information by referring them using other expressions. Um, this is uh, hard for uh, the bot to get it right. So supporting, uh, supporting this complex human bot patterns is a challenging for uh, the conversational bot. It is challenging because of the utterance variations in the open-end human bot interactions, and also because of the large space of services that are potentially unknown at the development time. Our broad objective is to support these complex conversations between user bot and services 
by dynamically and incrementally synthesizing executable conversation models from natural language conversations. In order to achieve this goal, we proposed in our previous work to, to represent bot behaviors, to represent user bot services interactions using the hierarchical state machine model. This hierarchical state machine model is a well-known model that has been used in a wide variety of areas to represent uh, reactive behaviors of complex systems. And yeah, it is a state machine where we have ordinary states and we have composite states and these composite states are machine, state machines by themselves. And we choose to use this model to represent both behaviors. Uh, we choose it because uh, it helps to reduce the complexity that may be caused by the number of states that are needed to, to represent the interaction between users, bot, and services. So this is an example of this conversational bot. Uh, the, the states at the high level uh, represent the user, the user intent fulfillment, meaning that if user, for example, want, uh, is looking for the weather forecast, what is the weather forecast? So we create a get weather uh, intent state. Then if the user is looking for restaurant, we create a find restaurant uh, state. The transitions in this model are probabilistic. For example, uh, when the, the user moves from this state to this state, we created a new intent transition. There is also the composite uh, state. Uh, in our conversational model, we use composite uh, state to represent complex dialogue patterns. And the substates of composite states represent situations where um, situations that a bot may occupy during the conversation. For example, the bot is looking for information, the bot is asking the user for information, or the bot is waiting for information, etc. In the work we are presenting today, we identified and characterized three types of uh, complex dialogue patterns that we represent as a composite states in the, the, the bot state machine model. And uh, to, to automatically recognize these uh, patterns, we rely on what we call complex knowledge service, a service that uh, provides uh, some knowledge, we will see it later, uh, provide some knowledge to support in order to support this dialogue patterns. So this, this uh, dialogue patterns will help to reduce useless interactions between human and bot, and also uh, which will make the conversation more natural. So let's start with the first pattern, the slot value flow pattern. Um, the intuition of this pattern comes from workflow management, meaning that in workflow management and processes, uh, there is a lot of input of activity of a process uh, that are output from previous activities. So we did the same in the context of chatbots, uh, meaning that the, the bot doesn't need to ask the user for a missing information if we can get it from the conversation history, if we can get it from the output of an already fulfilled intent. For example, here the bot uh, doesn't need to ask what is the destination address because the destination address, we can get it from restaurant address. Uh, here, the, the red one are the, the, red, the red slots are the input of the intent find the restaurant, and the blue one are the output. So we can just reuse the, the, the value of restaurant as destination address. 
So in general, this pattern um, help us to, to, to tell the bot behavior. Um, instead of annoy the user and ask her or him for uh, questions about an information, try to check if we already have this information. So instead of having this conversation, we will have this one, which is more natural and there is less useless interactions. And this is the, the composite state that represents the slot value flow pattern, where the, the bot first go to context state to get the missing information. In this case, it is the destination address. Then go to book taxi and fulfill this intent. The second pattern, the nested intent pattern, the intuition of this one comes from a programming perspective, meaning that um, in, fun uh, in functional uh, language, there are some parameters that are uh, functions by themselves. And to get the value of these parameters, we call functions. So we did the same, for example, here, the bot doesn't need to ask about uh, the contact email because there is an intent called get email. We can trigger this intent and get the value of the email. So supporting this pattern will give us more natural conversation like this. Um, this is the composite state that represents the nested intent pattern where the bot first go to a nested intent state, we call it, uh, in this case, it is get email, we call it nested intent state, to get the missing value, in this case, the value of the email, and come back to send message to, to send a message to the user. The third pattern is the API calls ordering pattern. Um, this pattern is related to, to API um, design constraints meaning that there is some methods that, uh, that they, they have um, an ID, an API generated ID as input. And this ID, we can get it from another method of the same API. For example, let's say that we have these two methods. We have start playlist and search items. These two methods belong, belong to Spotify API. And to start a playlist, we need a playlist ID. A playlist ID is a system generated string. We can get it by triggering search items, uh, intent or method. So humans or users, uh, the, they, the, they don't care about this uh, value of ID. We need to hide these technical details. So instead of uh, asking, for, uh, the, asking the user what is the ID, then the user needs first to, uh, most likely the user doesn't know what is uh, the ID, the value of the ID. So he needs to check it in the Spotify catalog, then ask again, please start the playlist with this specific value of um, the, the, the playlist ID. So instead of having this, supporting this uh, pattern will give us more simple and natural conversation. And this is, the, the bot can support uh, this pattern uh, based on uh, depend dependencies between methods, meaning that the bot will know that all oh, this start playlist depends on search items. So I need to go to search item, get the value of the ID, then go and start the playlist uh, for the user. So to support these three patterns, um, the bot has to access to some knowledge. Uh, that's why we propose the context knowledge service. Uh, the service has two parts, the metadata and the data. And uh, the metadata, we have it uh, before starting the conversation. It consists of a graph, 
where we have relationships between API methods, their parameters, entities, and attributes. And we have three types of relationship. We have one between uh, the relationship has between entity and an attribute. We have the depends on relationship that denotes this method depends on this one to get the ID value. And we have the same as uh, which is between uh, parameters to say uh, this parameter can reuse the value of this other parameter. For the data, uh, it is collected during the conversation and it consists of previous occurrences and the API calls, meaning the output, the input and output values of um, API method. In order to, to, to see if this proposed pattern naturally occurs when conversing with services, and to confirm that these patterns uh, really reduce useless interactions, we conducted a user study where we asked some participants to interact with three different chatbots and to perform three tasks with each chatbot. Each task is to evaluate one dialogue pattern. So this is the three chatbots and there is the, the third one uh, that supports the proposed dialogue patterns. So for the three tasks related to the three uh, dialogue patterns, uh, we asked participants which, uh, with which chatbot they had superior experience and why. And as you can see here, for the three tasks related to the three dialogue patterns, most participants reported having a superior experience with the chatbot three, the one that support the dialogue patterns. And when we asked them why, uh, they, they described the, the chatbot ability as uh, providing more natural conversations, uh, keeping track of the user goal and hiding technical uh, details for the, the third pattern. Uh, we did a conversation log analysis to see if this dialogue patterns naturally occur when conversing with services. Um, most of participants, uh, they naturally describe these patterns, uh, which proves that yes, these uh, patterns naturally occur when the user is conversing with services. And we perform a quantitative analysis where we compare, compare the three chatbots with an optimal reference uh, scenario based on three metrics. And as you can see here, the third chatbot is the closest one to the reference, the optimal reference scenario. It, uh, it has less turns, meaning less utterance and uh, response from the bot, uh, less prompts, less question to, to get uh, missing information. And it infers more uh, correct slot values. So it, uh, the, for the, the chatbot three help to reduce the useless interaction. For the related work, it can be divided in two parts. They are uh, model-based, including rule-based and flow-based. And they are data-based, including probabilistic models, uh, such as machine learning models, etc. So for the, the, the flow based, the, the model based, uh, the bot developer has to specify all the possible paths uh, that the bot can take, which is hard to do. And if the user deviates from one of this path, the, the bot will be enabled to respond, to answer. Uh, and yes, there is a high maintenance cost for these approaches. And for the probabilistic models, using these models uh, require uh, collecting a huge and high quality annotated training data and also conversation data between uh, human and bot. Um, although these probabilistic models, they give us uh, really sophisticated uh, support for 
recognizing slots, uh, recognizing intents, tracking dialogue states, etc. They generally don't uh, focus on the, the, the automatic detection or recognition of the complex dialogue patterns. Uh, in our approach, we, we did a hybrid approach, meaning that uh, it is model-based. We start with a small model that contains some information about um, the APIs, methods, their parameters, intents, etc. Then during the conversation, we collected uh, more data and the more we collect data, the more we create uh, paths between the different knowledge. So in this work, we identified and characterized three dialogue patterns that help to reduce the, the useless interactions and make uh, more natural conversations when interacting, when user interact with the bot. Um, we represented this dialogue in a composite uh, state uh, in the conversational model. Uh, this model is incrementally uh, constructed during the conversation. And um, yeah, here we focused on intent single API as a future work uh, we're um, investigating on uh, the intent composite API where we may have uh, an utterance uh, that uh, may involve more than one intent and both need to interact with composite services. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this interesting presentation. Uh, now we will ask uh, to, the, to the participants uh, who are 42 now. Uh, this is the context awareness that I could provide you, so we are many. Uh, and I hope that there will be challenging questions from the, from the assembly. So are there questions? You can write in questions and uh, responses uh, box or in the conversation box, as I understood. For the moment, uh, there is nothing, but maybe waiting the first question from the participants, I can start. Uh, I had a number of questions by listening your interesting work uh, and talk, uh, Sarah. Um, at the end of your presentation, you said that uh, more uh, conversation, you will have more uh, paths you, you will find. And it was, in fact, my first question. What is the scale of needed uh, number of uh, conversation, instances of conversation, which will allow you to start to produce uh, some patterns? Uh, and uh, the second part, uh, did you make it um, uh, blindly, I mean, or did you have some patterns in your mind when you started to make this uh, uh, analysis of uh, conversations in the beginning? Okay, so for the first uh, question, uh, in case we have, um, when we start the model, we have only uh, the, the information about the API methods. Uh, by the way, we built, uh, just let me show you, we built on this work uh, of uh, Cheyenne uh, Zamani Rad uh, on superimposition uh, super of natural language conversation over software enabled services. So we, from this work, we already have the knowledge about API parameters, uh, the, the utterances, the value of these parameters, etc. And upon this work, we tried to um, collect other information when we, we interact with the user, uh, like the, the input and the output parameters of the, 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 the methods. And uh, yeah, the, for the second question, how we build, how we, we construct this dialogue uh, patterns, um, it was the, the intuition that uh, we started with um, what is done in workflow, meaning that we have uh, input that are, uh, that we have the value of inputs are the output of some other services. So we can reuse them 
and we also uh, we also uh, the intuition also comes from what is done in the the linguistic theory uh, there is a uh, good work about this uh, called Iris, uh, where they, from con human conversations, they detect uh, the, they detect some dialogue patterns uh, that uh, that humans uh, use when they are uh, interacting in their day-to-day -day conversations. Um, for example. Uh, there is what is called nested conversations, meaning that sometimes humans uh, they talk about something, then go to a nested conversation, then come back to the main conversation. And based on all these existing patterns in the human conversation patterns, we try to apply them in the context of human bot interactions. Okay, Sarah, there is a question uh, uh, about the slide 18. Uh, can you re-explain, please, the three mm -hmm. metrics? Yes, of course. So, uh, you can see the, the slide, I think, because I... Uh, no, we cannot. Uh, and this is a question from the audience, uh, not from me. me. Uh, so, but we cannot see. We, you stop to share. Thank you. I will share again. So, okay, for the first pattern, uh, it turns, turns meaning that, uh, meaning the user utterance and response or question from the, the bot. Uh, for example, if the user says, what is the weather today in Paris? And then the bot responds, uh, we have a cloudy um, on the 22 degrees. These two uh, things, utterance and bot response, are called terms. The second one, prompts, are the question from the bot to the user about additional information, about not, ad not really additional information, about a missing information. For example, if I say, okay, uh, I'm looking for a restaurant, then the bot asks me, uh, where are you? So where are you is uh, the second metric, asking for uh, a missing information. And for the slots, the slots are the, the correct information, the correct slot value that the bot is uh, inferring. So all of these uh, metrics are related, meaning that if the, the bot asks less question, we will have less turns and the bot asks less questions, so we inferred the, the slot value. Okay, we have another question. I lost it. Uh, Ruben said thank you. I don't see the other. Uh, okay, it's in chat. Other... Uh, it's in chat. This is the because I, I saw something and it disappeared. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Sarah. Very interesting. I have a question. You see it at the end of your presentation. You have introduced two kind of approaches for chatbot: the model-based one and the probabilistic. For you, which method can provide us the best result in terms of analysis? Yeah, actually, we we think that combining both of them will uh, allow us to have better. Uh, results, meaning better chatbot, more robust chatbot. So combining the data model and also the model base will provide us better results. Thank you. Are there other questions uh, from the assembly, from participants? Uh, um, Anna, can I ask a question? Do we have time or uh, shall we stop? Uh, so so uh, I think that we can move to the next presentation now. Okay, you prefer. Okay.
Sarah, maybe we can exchange uh, through Vova. I don't know. I, I, I do not manipulate it very well. Try to contact me because I have few questions and maybe few points to, to, to share with you. Okay? Okay, thank you. So the second presenter is, uh, I don't have the, any, any uh, the, can you share it again, please, uh, Anna, your slide? Uh, sure. Um, Otherwise, I will move to my email. Uh, it is here. So the next presentation is from Alfonso Bravo, Design Patterns for Board-Based Collaborative Work Management Tools. So, so the floor is yours, Alfonso. Thank you, Salman. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alfonso Bravo from the University of Seville. I'm a PhD student, uh, particularly from the research group of applied software engineering. I, I'm going to present you our work, Design Patterns for Board-Based Collaborative Work Management Tools. Before starting with the content, we see the points that we're going to detail throughout the presentation. We will start with a brief introduction and context of our problem. Later, we will describe the analysis and our two proposals, a meta model for board design and the catalog of resulting patterns. We will see the level of application that these proposals currently have. And we will finish with the conclusions, limitations, and future work. Starting with the introduction, board-based collaborative work management tools as Basecamp, Jira, Asana, Trello, or Planner, Interalia, are software that allow the users to manage content in the context defined by a board. They first were conceived for managing collaborative work and for being used in work groups. But as we review with the recent literature, it has been extended to many other contexts and the use is increasingly widespread, especially due to the pandemic situation of last year and a half. We have selected Trello for carrying our study, but the results and conclusions obtained are also applicable to the rest of the tools because we will consider features and uses that are present in all the cited software. An example of the use of this tool is shown in this slide. In this case, we are representing the process of writing a research paper. We have written the titles in the cards and we will monitor them according to their respective state, which is represented in the list names. From inception, in the first list, to the acceptance or rejection, which is in the last two lists. We are managing eight papers with this board, as there are eight different cards with their respective titles. And as we show in the video, a paper will be moved from one status to another as it evolves in real life. This movement is logically ordered and predefined because it doesn't make sense to move a paper from accepted to rejected, for example. But before using the board, we have to design it. For this, we have to decide what are we going to represent with lists and cards, how many lists do we need, or whether the cards move throughout the board's list, uh, among many other decisions. These decisions is what we call design phase. With this diagram, we represent one option to do this. We can design our board from scratch, creating it according to our needs and basing the design on our knowledge or our ideas. This gives rise to many problems because, for example, when we design a board from scratch, we don't have any type of support or guide, uh, and this is especially important for non-expert or non-technical users. We can find another alternative design option that solves the previous problem to some extent, thanks to the use of repositories of templates. In this case, the user has to copy, clone, and adapt an existing template from that repository and reuse it without redesigning it again. 
but in most cases the user has to adapt some features to make the template work as he needs. This behavior of cloning and adapting repository templates suppose that there is no quality filter in the template repository because everybody can create a template in Trello and publish it without any expert validating it. Besides that, uh, some templates are reusable and other ones are designed to be copied. Other templates need adaptations, but mm, uh, some others are boards that are published as templates, but they can be reused and so on. So in both design options, there are problems to develop that design phase, either due to lack of help and structure solutions, or due to problems derived from reusing solutions of dubious quality and the need to readapt them to the user's needs. In the CITE Trello templates repository, we can find currently uh, 14 different categories in which a template can be classified, ranging from business to team management. They are topic-based categories, so Trello is distinguishing them depending on their respected using context. And due to this, it's very frequent that the user choose a template because of its context, the category, but finally, he has to adapt it. This also supposes that we have templates with many different behaviors into the same topic-based category. We also find that the expected behavior or use of a Trello template is described textually, as shown in the slide. And this, united with the previously cited lack of quality filter, gives rise to very poor explanations as in the right example, in which the creator described its templates in only one sentence. Due to this, the information is unstructured or even insufficient. In addition, this approach allows indiscriminated copy and paste behaviors without doing an appropriate use of the tools. Once we have seen the current problems, let's see our proposal. To analyze the existing solutions, we did a web scrapping of the Trello repository, obtaining the 90, 91 templates that were at that time. And then three researchers from the author's team analyzed them, trying to recognize different aspects that could help to identify categories among the templates, also considering other related world literature. When we completed this first iteration, we tried to reach a consensus about which of the detected elements were the common factor that defined the patterns. But unfortunately, not all the analyzed templates fit into the proposed patterns, and therefore another round was necessary. In this second iteration, we considered not only the, the template static structure, and the elements used in the previous round, but also their dynamic behavior. And in this second proposal, uh, we covered all the analyzed templates, as well as the templates proposed in the analyzed related literature. So uh, this gives rise to our phase contribution, which is the meta model for board design in which uh, abstracting the specific features of the particular used software, we can describe any board design according to three elements detected in the previous analysis process. These three elements are the type of cards, which is the content that we are managing with the board, the semantic precedence, which is the order relationship between the board's lists, and the card flow and its type, which is the movement of the cards among the lists of the board. We represent them using the graphical notation of the left of the slide to represent this visually and thus understand it easier than with the meta model. Applying the previous meta model and the, the cited graphical notation, we could represent the first example about the process of writing a research article that we saw at the beginning of the presentation. 
And as we previously explained, in this case, we would be representing resources in the cards as we are managing the titles of the articles. In this case, we don't have any example card because here we're modeling the template of the research process and not the particular use of the board with the specific cards as we show at the beginning of the presentation. Here we have also card flow because the, the cards will move as they evolve and we will also have semantic precedence because the movement follows the previously explained logical rules as it's indicated by the dashed arrows. In this other example, imagine that we want to represent the task of a process. In this case, we are representing a design sprint with six different phases and with their corresponding tasks. For this reason, uh, we will have task lists as it's indicated by the tick of the upper left corner of each list. As we can guess, there is an order relationship between them because the preparation uh, has to be done before the prototype, for example. This is why there are dashed arrows connecting these lists in that logical order to make explicit that semantic precedence. Finally, uh, in this case, we will not have a cut flow as in the previous example, because here we are classifying the tasks by the project phase and we are not monitoring the state as the example of the, of the articles. Combining the three elements of the meta model, we obtain eight different and combinations that conform the catalog of patterns for board-based collaborative work management tools that we propose as second contribution. It's summarized in the table of the slides and it's based on the values of the CAD flow, the semantic precedence and, and the CAD type, which is what characterizes a board design uniquely and indistinctly, as we have seen with the previous examples. Each pattern represents a well-characterized uh, way of use that provides uh, quality solutions to existing problems. For each pattern, we, will, we provide the following information, its name, its problem, the solution that it provides, and an example of use. To illustrate the previously explained patterns, we will show an example of one of them. This is the case of the pattern categorized information. We describe its related problem in one sentence. We explain the solution that we provide with its use in another one or two sentence. And finally, we provide an example of use of real Trello templates in which this pattern has been detected and we describe how it's used. After seeing how patterns are defined, let's see an example of this last categorized information pattern to illustrate it. Let's imagine that we want to visit another country and that we want to organize all the information about the trip before doing it. Thus, we want to have information about the travel and the hotel, the places to see, the food and the transport, for example. In this way, we are managing resources associated with that uh, cited categories. And this is why we have resources lists, as it's indicated by the document icon in the upper left corner of each list. In this case, there is no uh, semantic precedence because we could, uh, we could change the appearance order of the list without modifying their meaning or their information. And there is neither card flow because a card that represents a uh, food will be always on the food list and will never change its classification to transport, for example. This is why we don't have the dashed arrows or the rectangle framing the list as in the previous templates. And next, we are going to show how templates are currently used according to the previous, previously explained proposals. 
we classified each of the 91 Trello existing templates that we used to carry out the analysis described at the beginning. And if we summarize that, in that classification, we can see how Kanban information lifecycle and categorized information are currently the most used patterns. This is probably due to they represent the typical main use case for which board-based tools were initially created. Regarding the other patterns, they are less frequent, probably because the purpose differs more from the best known uses of board-based tools. In any case, we can find at least one board design in the set of templates analyzed that matches with one of our proposed patterns. We expect that after making explicit this catalog of patterns, some of them like assigned information, assigned tasks, or categorized tasks could increase their use as they are also useful and they provide interesting solutions. We also found that patterns are not mutually exclusive and some of them can be used together in, in the same board as we show in this slide. We have detected combinations of Kanban with, with process tasks, combinations of categorized information with process tasks, and combinations of Kanban with categorized information. We believe that the motivation behind these combinations is to obtain the advantages of using them separately. For example, in the case of Kanban used together with categorized information, we will have in the same board the state of the task of the project, as well as other uh, relevant information of the project. As conclusions of our work, we can see uh, first that we have proposed a first approach of design patterns in the context of board-based collaborative work management tools. And for this, we provide a meta model for board design and a catalog of a design patterns as main proposals. In particular, the meta model provides a structured way to make explicit information about the design decisions involved in the use of these tools that were up to now implicit or informally explained using natural language. This information would be clearer to the user and will help him when, when designing or using the board. In addition, we now provide in eight patterns the information that was spread over 91 templates with the problems that it entailed as we have detailed throughout the presentation. But uh, there is a relevant difference between patterns and templates. Uh, for example, like two organizations uh, need to adapt their process and information systems to the way they work. The same applies to board designs derived from some pre-existing template uh, because the knowledge of board-based patterns can help organizations to customize these, these boards to their needs, even if the starting point of the board is a Trello template. Regarding the implications for practice, the catalog of eight patterns could be an advantageous tool for users to design boards more effectively and efficiently. As it has been proven in many other contexts, as software, fashion, or architecture, patterns promote reuse, uh, enhance design effectiveness, reduce the errors derived from incomplete or incorrect solutions, and they speed up the development process, avoiding the need to reinvent the wheel. We believe that our proposed patterns uh, could bring all those benefits to the board-based tools context, but we will validate it empirically. At last, we tend to discuss the future work that our paper gives rise to. First, we plan to conduct an empirical study on board-based tools users to validate the benefits of using patterns. 
Just we will analyze if our theoretically detected benefits are useful for most users in practice. In addition, based on the meta model and the graphic notation, it's possible to create an editor of board designs. This will help the user at the designing phase and will reduce designing errors. And finally, we are currently developing and, test and testing a pattern recommender tool that suggests which is the pattern that better fits the user needs based on the characterization that the own user gives about its problem. It characterizes uh, the user's problem according to the detected three key elements, which are the card type, the semantic precedence, and the card flow, and it provides the better possible solution to it. Thank you all for your attention. I attach my contact information on the slide in case you need any extra information. And if you have any kind of question, comment, or suggestion, I will be delighted to answer it. Thanks. Thank you, Alfonso, for this uh, presentation. So about design patterns for a collaboration uh, board. Uh, um, there is one question, but I would prefer, it is one of my students, so I can allow to myself to push the question a little bit later because it, it will, uh, he is asking to go more into the solution of meta model because he did not uh, read enough, but uh, uh, we can come back on this. Uh, before, I would like uh, uh, to see whether there are other questions more on the problem statement part from the assembly. Uh, do you have questions with respect to the purpose, to the added value, etc., of the uh, work uh, presented by Alfonso? Otherwise, I will ask you one. Um, you, you say that, that design patterns uh, will uh, allow uh, uh, design boards will be uh, constructed more efficiently and eff efficiently, efficiently. Uh, but I would like to ask you whether you have some measurements because I, I would like to come back to the reasons of your, of your interesting work, uh, but you are in the solution. I would like to push you a little bit towards the problem statement that you had in the beginning for making this, uh, this work. Uh, did you observe that the design made uh, using Trello, et cetera, was inefficient because people are losing time? What, is your, what, what was your starting point? And to which extent your solution improved uh, the situation? Okay, uh, for example, uh, I am going to share. Here we can see uh, two examples of uh, two different templates, which are named uh, Simple Project Board and Premortem. And they both are classified in the same project management uh, category. This is why we said uh, here that the topic-based ca uh, classification, which is currently in Trello, is inefficient because uh, the most of the users will select a template, a, a board, uh, depending on the on the context or the domain for which he is, he is going to use the the board. But the classification uh, based on the on the topic on their domain, uh, we consider that is inefficient because uh, it's not considering the the behavior, the structure. Uh, and the use uh, of the of the board and its elements, which is uh, what we what we have detected with the meta model. Okay, and did you have the opportunity, the chance, the possibility to test this uh, in the same context, but maybe with similar people, in order to see the difference, or to provide to the same people who provided. Uh, uh, in more times, uh, something a board, and then with the patterns, they they they, uh, uh, they they succeeded in a better time. Did you did you yeah. have the chance to make this evaluation? Uh, 
we are currently evaluating it with the with the okay. recommended tool that we are developing now and with this as we are uh, providing a solution an existing solution based on our eight patterns uh, we are also testing uh, in parallel if this solution also provides benefits in in practice as we said here uh, to know if the if these benefits that we have detected theoretically are also applicable for most users in practice okay uh, so if there is not other uh, question and i don't see other question i will come back to the question of, from yasin uh, can you please zoom, he says, in the meta model you presented and explain it more clearly because it was unreadable. So I suggest also to open the proceedings and now uh, Alfonso will help you to better understand. Please go on, Alfonso. Slide uh, of meta model, he says. There is also a question in chat, a new one. And the question in the chat. Uh, Can you please explain what are the advantages of combining two patterns, like for example, Kanban and categorized information? Yes. Maybe you uh, can start by this one. Yeah. When, when we detect one pattern in a template, we are detecting uh, these three elements, the card type, the semantic precedence, and the card flow, and uh, characterizing them into, into the template but we have detected that some uh, existing templates in Trello uh, combines more than one of, of the patterns that we have detected here. Uh, for example, there are some, uh, some lists that have a semantic precedence and car flow and some other lists into the same board that doesn't have the semantic precedence or this car flow. We can also find uh, some of the lists of the of the template of the board with uh, uh, resources uh, to to store resources and some other lists to to store uh, tasks. Uh, in this way, uh, in the same board as we said, uh, we will have the two uh, structures, the two patterns but uh, in the in the same board we we will be able to divide a, a kanban part of the board and a categorized information part uh, as we add uh, the two the two patterns in the same in the same board we could distinguish them uh, clearly into two different uh, boards uh, separating the, those elements those leads but uh, we uh, frequently uh, find them used together to combine the advantages of using them separately uh, for example with kanban we will monitor the state of the tasks of our project and with categorized information we will uh, store the relevant information of our project for the same example if we combine them into the same board, we will have the tasks and the, and the state and the information both in the same, uh, in the same board and it will be more, more efficient to the, to the project management. Okay, thank you, Alfonso. Are there other questions or do you wish to come back to the meta model for one minute uh, to say more? Or? Yeah, of course. After the meta model, there was a, uh, there was a raised hand uh, from oh. Yanis, so I can um, I didn't allow see the them. Hand, uh, Okay, so you will, you will give the to, to the right person, Anna, because I didn't yes, see the hand. Yes, sure. Um, so, Yenis, if, uh, if uh, you want, you can now ask your question. 
uh, the, it was not much of a question. I was uh, now this disturbs the flow of discussion. But uh, I was thinking for future work. You've created a lot of patterns, nice things. Some people are resistant to patterns. They want to do things their own way. So in the process of you said you're gonna sort of validate whether the patterns how they fit uh, and how they are used so in the process of doing this you will probably discover a lot of anti-patterns that's a cool concept basically capturing what are the bad but attractive solutions to a known problem so i i mean if you want to future work issue this could be sort of a a side thing that you could create saying don't do this it, it looks maybe a good idea but it isn't so doing that kind of uh, knowledge capture as well thanks otherwise yeah nice presentation thank you janis uh, we will consider it anti-patterns yeah <laughs> uh, do we have time or we have to move or, uh, i think we have Anna? to move to okay. the next presentation. So I, I can share my screen uh, with... Thank, thank you, Alfonso. Thank you. Um, so the next, I will open my, my email is here. The next last presentation is from Davide Lanti. And yes. the, 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 the talk is about an automatic alignment of data sources using mapping patterns. So, yes, uh, I share Davide. my screen. Yes. And here we go. Yeah. So thanks. So I am uh, Davide Lanti and uh, I am a researcher at the Free University of Bozen Bolzano. And this is a joint work with my colleagues Diego, Diego Galvanese, Marco Montali, Alessandro Mosca, and plus our two colleagues from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology in Haifa in Israel. And it talks about uh, Adamap, that is an algorithm for automatic alignment of data sources using these so-called mapping patterns. Uh, I will start with a bit of motivation. So this talk deals with this with the common problem of uh, let's say handling huge amounts of data. So we know that in the modern world, uh, lots of data is produced, and the question is how to make uh, effective use of such data. Well, to make effective use of such data uh, or to create value actually out of such data, what you have to do is uh, as a first thing, as a first requirement, you have to access this data efficiently. Uh, but then there comes an issue now. It comes out that with our conventional tools, like for instance, relational databases that have been developed in the past years, navigating such uh, big data is not so convenient to the end user. And uh, my next two examples will try to convince you about that. So the first one comes from um, European Project Optic in which UniBZ, uh, University of Bolzano was a partner uh, um, in the consortium. And uh, this is an oil platform uh, of, uh, of Statoil that was uh, a Norwegian um, petroleum company. And uh, there, there were these domain experts that were essentially geologists that were essentially expressing queries in, uh, let's say, natural language. So a query by a geologist looked like this. So um, you see this uh, is a natural language query that is quite verbose. And uh, the funny thing here about uh, this is that such a query that although it is quite verbose as a natural language query, one might not think that this corresponds actually to a very complex SQL query. However, actually it does. So this was the SQL query corresponding um, to this natural language query. So you can well imagine that uh, domain experts that are geologists, that they have different field of expertise than uh, what it is actually required to write such a complex SQL query, of course. So what was happening there is that such queries were being formulated by the IT department. So there were the geologists, they were sending mails to the IT personnel 
And then they were asking, okay, I want to retrieve this piece of information. Such, such piece of information was being expressed as a natural language question. And then the IT department, after a few of interactions, like, like ping pong, <laughs> the such a monster huge query was being produced. Now, within uh, this Optic project, the solution we provided was uh, to essentially uh, conceptualize somehow the, um, the data that was stored at the level of the database at a higher level. Mm -hmm. So essentially this is a query that is written in a SparkQL syntax where SparkQL is the query language, uh, actually the recommended, uh, the standard query language for querying knowledge graphs in the context of the semantic web. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, this SparkQL query is much shorter, much less verbose than the SQL query we have, uh, we, I have shown in the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Also, oh, please observe that this query makes use of, um, of uh, words that are close to the actual natural language query question, such that uh, stratigraphic zone or, uh, or uh, chronostratigraphic column, these are all technical terms that to us as computer scientists might sound uh, uh, far from our domain of expertise. However, these are uh, very well known to the geologists. Of course, the geologists themselves did not have to write Sparker queries. What was happening there is that we provided them with a tool uh, that was a graphical tool that was essentially where the geologists were put in the blocks and then the system was automatically um, producing out of this uh, graphical representation of a query, the corresponding Sparkle query you see here, and then the system was automatically translating such Sparkle query into a SQL query over the data sources. We will, we will say a bit more about that later. Here we have another motivating example, and this is a bit more recent. So uh, currently we're working in another European project uh, that is called iNode. And in the picture here, you see a telescope uh, the telescope used for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So what is this uh, Sky Survey? It is essentially a database, a SQL database, where information about galaxies, stars, and uh, let's say all um, um, pieces of land that are in the universe are essentially collected and categorized. Here, the, they also have an access issue, but it is slightly different. So for instance, um, uh, if we want to retrieve all stars that are white dwarfs, and this would be one possible SQL queries to do that over this uh, sky server database. So as you can see, we have two, um, let's call them issues here. So the first one is that the, there are some attribute names with not very informative, uh, uh, that are not very informative in terms of natural language. So for instance, U and G, uh, if, 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 us read this, we cannot really relate to what they are actually, instead they correspond to, to measures, to different measures of magnitude, actually to different spectrum of the, of the magnitude uh, that is the light that is emitted by a star, for instance. And now this query is saying, okay, if this, the difference between this magnitude U and magnitude G is less than 0 0.4, and then we have this, uh, this other difference is less than 0 0.7, et cetera, et cetera. Well then, uh, and, and, and of course this object is a star, then that one, uh, is a white dwarf. Uh, what if actually the user might just be able to provide a query like this instead? So a Sparkle query where it says, okay, retrieve me all the axes where X must be a white dwarf. This is the solution we want to achieve. How do we achieve such a solution? We use the so-called ontology-based data access approach or also known as a knowledge graph for data access in this slide. The idea is the following. So we have the data that might be, might come from heterogeneous sources in the end. So it might come from a relational database, from a structured data like CSV files. And all of these data sources are federated into a relational engine like, like a TAID or Dremio, so a SQL federator essentially. And we have uh, uh, an ontology that is a domain ontology. What does this ontology do? Well, first, it provides a vocabulary that is convenient to the, to the end user and that it is actually well known by the domain experts, so by the, by the actual users of the system. Um, and secondly, it also encodes uh, uh, semantic information about the domain of interest. And uh, 
Well, then there is a third component that is this mapping. And what does this mapping do? Well, it actually connects uh, the portions of the data, of the federated data, to the actual uh, classes and properties that are specified in the ontology. So it has to populate the ontology, let's say, and obtain a so-called knowledge graph. So essentially we have our data that can be relational or structured in, uh, or unstructured. And then in the end, we expose such data in the form of a graph. Now, this graph could come in two different uh, forms. First one is the virtual knowledge graph thing that is supported by a system on top that we developed here in Bolzano. And what happens in the virtual approach? Well, actually the, the user sends a Spark QR query to the, to the on top system. And the user just sees the data as if the data were stored as a graph. Okay, so he sees the ontology and, and writes his, so it's a Spark QR query and retrieves his, his results in the form of Spark QR triples. Um, but the system does not actually create a graph. So the graph is only virtual. The system translates on the fly this Spark QR query by using also the, the, the semantics that is encoded in the ontology into the corresponding SQL queries over the data source, over the federated data source. Another approach is the one where we actually uh, materialize the knowledge graph. So instead of using on top, you use a, a traditional triple store, like it could be Virtuoso Stardog. And essentially we create a copy of the data that is just in the form of, of, a, of a graph. So what is the advantage of the, of the virtual approach is that essentially the data is always fresh because we do, not, uh, we do not need to create a copy of the data. We just directly uh, access the, the data sources. What is the advantage of all this solution? Well, is that we hide the complexity of data storage behind the, the convenient representation that is given by the ontology. So I told you that the ontology gives, uh, this, uh, encodes the semantics and plus it also provides a convenient vocabulary. So if we go back, for instance, to this uh, here, this U attribute might, we, might be known in the ontology with a more meaningful name, like for instance, magnitude and then uh, U for instance. Um, but now, as you can see here, to realize this solution, we need a few artifacts. So we need the ontology, we need the mappings, and we need the data sources. So who is going to provide all of this? As we know, designing an ontology, uh, but also actually modeling in any conceptual modeling language is not an easy task at all. And uh, what happens usually is that for applying this knowledge graph for data access approach, we take uh, ontologies that were developed independently by trained experts and that they are already available to be reused. This is common, for instance, for the biomedical domain, which is also, by the way, one of the domains we are studying this Synod European project. What is also an advantage of reusing existing ontology is that essentially by doing so, we somehow uh, allow interoper interoperability between different sources because all these sources in the end must agree to the vocabulary used in the ontology and, and so different systems can speak to each other. So this is also an advantage. More critical is the situation for the mappings. So the mapping is essentially is composed of two parts. It is a SQL query over the data sources, and there is a target part of the mapping that specifies how the results from the SQL query have to be transformed into nodes in the knowledge graph. So this is very strictly correlated to the, or related to the data sources. So this is really something attached to the specific data source you are considering. So you cannot develop a mapping and then reuse it somewhere else. So this means that you have each time create a new mapping, and this is an activity that if done manually is very time consuming and also error prone. To give you an idea, this is just five tables from the Sky Server database. And you see these tables contain hundreds of attributes. So if we had to map each one of these attributes to the graph, this would become already quite a um, gargantuan task. Another issue when designing a mapping is uh, about the discrepancy between uh, the conceptual level and, and, and the database level. So for instance, it might not be just the complexity coming from the high number of attributes that you have in your relational schema, but also 
coming from the fact that uh, you need to transform the values that you find in the database into commonly understood values that you can then share among different ontologies. So for instance, here, we see that this SQL query here that is very complex transforms what the ones in the database into the fixed value NCIT. So this is just the label of a gene. So this, this one corresponds to this gene and this is the name that we are going to use from now on in the ontology. Then we will use this name to populate here the, the nodes in the graph. So this is the triple notation of RDF. So by instantiating these uh, placeholders that are the colored, the colored strings here, we obtain triples and the, these correspond to nodes and edges in the graph intuitively. So instead of this, uh, our idea, since this is a very difficult task, is to study uh, or to, 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 to take the problem from the perspective of patterns. So the idea is the following. We know from relational database theory that uh, usually a database is modeled after a conceptual schema. That is what? An ER diagram, right? And, um, for, and this ER diagram is developed usually to sound and uh, well-established conceptual modeling principles. So this is a very good starting point for an ontology if you want to use this knowledge class of data access approach. Unfortunately, the drawback is that, is that this ER diagram is not uh, available anymore when you have a database. Um, however, what happens is that uh, uh, by observing the schema of the database, we can somehow reconstruct a posteriori what the conceptual schema uh, might have looked like, or at least restrict the number of alternatives. <coughs> Sorry. And, uh, and this, starting from this observation, we created our so-called mapping pattern. So a mapping pattern puts into correspondence a pair of ER diagram and its corresponding translation to a database schema. This comes from the well-established literature of databases. So these transformations are, are let's say, uh, not losing, this is not a, a, a transformation of schemas that is losing information, let's say. And then uh, the other part of the pattern is made up of what? Of an ontology that encodes the actual ER diagram, so the conceptual schema, into the, into the R2QL ontology language. That is the language uh, for specifying ontologies in this setting of knowledge class for data access, okay? So for instance, here we are just saying that the domain of each uh, attribute should be of the class E. And then, the mapping is just populating these uh, classes. So for instance, we create uh, um, objects in the class E and we create data properties. So a bit more to detail, uh, underlined here means that this is a primary key. The arrow indicates that this is a foreign key. This is called the source part of the mapping assertion. It's just a query over the data source. And this is called the target part that specifies how the triples are constructed. And these TF functions, TE functions, they are called URI template functions and transform database values into URIs that are then essentially these URIs correspond to the objects uh, that I have in the graph, okay? <coughs> As I said before, this was a domain axiom and this one is a range axiom. Let's go with an example. So um, assume that you have this conceptual model. So employee works at a company, very simple one. Well, according to this SR pattern, this, um, so if, 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 we, if we translate this into a, a database, if, if we do it in the sound way, then this is what we have to do. So we have an employee, three tables, employee, work set and company. And uh, the mapping and the ontology specified here would uh, essentially expose an RDF graph that looks like this. So we have URIs for these green, uh, these gray nodes, okay, these are URIs, and these URI are built out of these TF and TE functions, and this one is the actual, the, the one value that was here for employees, so the value that was being used to identify employee, and we built so an, an object of the class employee, this was, this, so this employee works set a company that is of type company, they share the same uh, EID or CID attribute and uh, a value for these two attributes and uh, the, this employee has this name Ginetto and the name, the corporation has a name. 
David, sorry, so, uh, uh, um, yes. I interrupt you. Um, so a few minutes left. Uh, oh. Yes, okay, thanks. Now, Thank you. if what happens if we had a salary here, where well, then uh, uh, it's not clear anymore how to do this because work set is a property and we cannot attach uh, attributes to, to properties. So how do we solve this? Well, we actually have to reify. So this is another pattern. And what happens is that we create an object for uh, the tuple in the relationship, and then we uh, connect this object corresponding to the tuple to the actual employee and company. This is how we solve the problem. Now here, uh, there are other patterns. These are all based uh, to, on the schema of the database. So we need to have the information about primary keys and foreign keys in order to apply such patterns. And uh, Patterns do not only, uh, let's say, uh, limit to schema-driven ones, so where you need the schema. So for instance, you might also observe patterns in the data. So this is a clustering. So we have these employees and they are clustered in males and females according to the attribute sex, okay? So in the ontology, we could create two classes, one for male, one for female, and populate such classes accordingly. So this is a data-driven pattern. Now let's go to the algorithm. The idea of this algorithm of Adamap is that we want to classify each table in the database scheme according to a pattern, okay? And uh, to do this, this is simple decision diagram. Um, and uh, now, so for instance, if there are no foreign keys, then according to the mapping patterns we have specified, then this is the SE pattern, so schema entity. We create just an entity, we map it. In case there is a foreign key, well, then it might be either a hierarchy of entities or a single entity, or it might be also um, a relationship that has been merged into a table and then we all plus a hierarchy and so on and so forth. Um, now, the evaluation here, uh, and this is some, something a bit new for, with respect to this research over uh, generating uh, mappings and ontologies, we have considered real world scenarios here. So we have taken an NPDN Cordis, where the former is a scenario with a high number of mappings, more than 1K. However, many of them are automatically generated through other methods, uh, such as the direct mapping. But there are also several complex manually written mappings as well. The other, uh, the other setting is Cordis, where the mappings were manually written, all of them, and the amount 120. What we observe is the following. So in this first analysis, we do not test Adamap, but rather we test whether the mappings we have identified actually occur in the scenarios. So uh, we see that for Cordis, uh, out of 120 patterns, 89 of them can be justified through one mapping pattern. So it, we, it's just the result of applying one, one of the mappings we have specified. Uh, actually of the schema patterns, because these are not, not all the mapping patterns we have defined, these are only the schema ones that we are considering here. And the situation is similar for uh, NPD, uh, where we have also that 672 mappings out of 1,100 uh, 1, uh, can be actually uh, automatically recognized uh, by just looking at the definition of the mapping pattern. The second analysis is instead analysis on over Adamap itself. So here we compare the output of the Adamap algorithm that is associated to each table, a pattern, and a classification that was manually performed by, by domain experts. So I was, uh, there were, for instance, if the expert observed a specific mapping and an ontology, so it says that, okay, here this pattern has been applied. The pattern that has been applied is the one that Adamap um, has had foreseen for this table or not. And for measuring this kind of information, we use the traditional measures of precision, recall, and F1 measure. This is just a synthesis of the two, of the two, of, of precision and recall. What we get is that essentially we get a very, for, so for the core, this scenario, we get a very good uh, precision and recall. And F measures, they all uh, are equal to 0 0.8. So um, the, Manual analysis and the algorithm agree on 80% of the cases. On the other 20%, the, the, the person who has written the mapping and the ontology has taken a different choice on how uh, that conceptual element had to be mapped into an ontology. Um, and instead for MPD, 
uh, we have uh, a, even a higher precision of 88, uh, and we're also higher in terms of, of the other two measures as well. So uh, with recall and F measures. So let's go, let's move to the conclusions. So first, something about related work. So there have been multiple tools and approaches that deal with the problem of generating automatically mappings and ontologies. However, there are the, our work is substantially different. So first of all, in these works, there is not really a systematic categorization of the mappings that they are producing. Uh, it's just an algorithm. Uh, they, they give you the algorithm and then they say, okay, and the, the output of the algorithm is, is just uh, what comes after executing the algorithm. And also, the out, that output has not been justified or, or actually, let's, let's say this better, has neither been validated against a use case or real world scenario has been done here, nor it has been um, validated by looking at, uh, at uh, how this <laughs> output can be derived from sound and well-established technique coming from the database literature. Okay, so from this ER modeling and translation into the relational model. Um, now the conclusion is that, okay, we have introduced this ADAMAP, this algorithm technique that extracts semantics uh, uh, from the relational data source. Uh, and it does this by relying on the notion of mapping patterns. This can be used to support the automatic generation of ontologies and mappings. However, it can be used also for other scenarios. Uh, like if you want to validate whether your mappings are correct or not. Uh, whether what you have done actually is compliant with sound uh, methodology coming from the database literature, for instance. The patterns uh, identified by, my, by Adamap are not enough. Of course, people will still have to write their own mappings. However, they provide a basis that can later on be improved. And the validation that we perform confirms that actually the identified patterns uh, um, are actually uh, those that uh, human experts usually use. Future work is that, uh, well, Adamap only returns one pattern for one table, but this uh, is not true in general. So you might have several patterns applicable for the same table and Adamap returns just the most typical one. And this is one of the reasons why there was disagreement between the user, the human experts and the algorithm. And also Adamap does not take into account for data. And this, we said that this might become important, but might be important in the end. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Davide, uh, but we have only three minutes for questions now. So uh, we will ask to the participants who are 51 now, uh, whether they have questions uh, for Davide related to alignment of data. I don't see anything in the conversation and I don't see hands and neither in questions and answers. Um, I, I, I would have, it's not a question, but it's, uh, it would be a kind of uh, um, surprise uh, because uh, if I understood well, you tell that uh, on the side of entity relationship modeling, conceptual modeling, there is not uh, too much related work. That's right, uh, Davide? Or the, did I Of course, on conceptual modeling, there is a lot of work, but on the connection between uh, uh, the generation, automatic generation of mappings and ontologies and that field of research, uh, conceptual modeling, etc., there is not an explicit connection, at least uh, in the works we have analyzed. Okay, uh, but, but I would this like- This is surprising uh, also for us, actually. Yeah, I would like to recommend you to have a, a little bit older uh, references because I had a look, I was surprised by this, uh, by this, uh, by your words, and I had a look in your references, and the oldest one is in 2008. But in the database and conceptual modeling uh, uh, domain, uh, this kind of work, uh, uh, at least integration of uh, conceptual models, conceptual data models, has been an issue uh, in uh, uh, early 90s. So you are I, right. I like you to, are you are right, and uh, maybe we distribute so databases, have to look integrated at that. databases, etc. Yeah, there is et a lot, a lots of research in that. We haven't really. So what we have looked at is what is really closer to our field. That is all these approaches uh, 
coming from the semantic web. Uh, so they are all uh, after 2010, let's say, where this, uh, because ontology-based data access was introduced in 2006. So then all these uh, problems, so these approaches have been developed after that. And we have the, the literature research we have done has, has focused mostly on that, or, although we also have seen other works from other. I see, I um, see, but, I, I, but it would be a pity to not to not have the lessons learned from this uh, earlier work about this subject it is an Definitely. interesting indeed, and, indeed, and indeed, still uh, still an issue today it is an issue what it to, has been an issue since 40 years huh? indeed what we were doing now we were reading works from hal uh, about the lossless transformations again of schemas and trying to relate the patterns we have uh, introduced here to that to that literature about to see whether actually what we are doing is actually sound and complete with respect to the information that was originally available in the database schema. So this is something, some, some, some practice that is quite common in the database literature. However, this has never been done also in the, in the semantic um, web uh, approaches we've seen. So this is also something where we're looking at. The um, timekeeper, the timekeeper is uh, coming. To, no, to, no, to no, no, no. Uh, Avigor, um, I, I think, uh, has a question. So I am I'm, I'm muted. So you, you can now, yeah, um, yeah question a comment. Okay, so, well, it's, it's not a question. It was just, uh, I wanted yeah. to uh, relate to Selmin's uh, comment. And um, the, um, it's, it's not that the day that um, uh, model integration was not uh, in the literature before, obviously it has, and the work in the 90s was very interesting on, on specific topics. What we offer here is more of um, a modular approach, which we haven't seen, in a way that we take the footprints of the conceptual model in the schema, build from it small components of ontologies, which later can be uh, integrated. And I think that in that sense, we, we add to the, um, um, uh, to the literature. Sure, sure, you are adding, but I, I'm just telling that it would be a pity to not have the older literature. I'm not telling that you are not doing more, <laughs> Avi. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. No, definitely. <laughs> And Bertrand Bar Bar uh, Talheim is uh, suggesting a book, huh? Springer 2011 conceptual ah, okay. modeling. So maybe you can have some uh, more uh, specific input. So, okay. so th thank you for, uh, are there other questions from the audience? Otherwise, I think we have to move to the social virtual beer session. Right, Anna? Yes, that's correct. So thank you very much for interesting talks and please join us for a social uh, meeting, virtual beer or wine or coffee. So it's a different link. Uh, it's a different link. Okay, so many thanks to all presenters. Thank you, David. Uh, Avi, and uh, so see you in the social uh, uh, virtual beer session. <laughs> see you, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.